Humanity is on thin ice, and that ice is melting fast. The climate time bomb is ticking. The 2022 report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change details that humans are responsible for virtually all global heating in the last 200 years. The rate of temperature rise in the last half century is the highest in 2,000 years. Emissions continue to remain on an unsustainable growth trajectory. And at this rate, keeping global, keeping global temperature rise under 1.5 degrees just won't be possible. In fact, if we do not change drastically, it is expected for us to reach this limit in just nine years. Some research suggests even four. Energy consumption is the largest contributor to global CO2 emissions, and this continues to grow year after year. If evidence linking energy consumption and excessive CO2 emissions is clear, why hasn't there been a reduction in our CO2 emissions? Why hasn't there been a faster transition to clean energy? And why hasn't there been more investment into renewable resources and their infrastructure? Well, this is because renewable resources come with disadvantage after disadvantage. High costs, low efficiency, unreliability, intermittency, the list goes on. Developments in these renewable resources are nowhere near what they should be if we were to solely rely on them. But either way, there are just too many inherent challenges for us to progress to a place where solar reliance could even become a reality. Let's take a look at some examples. Solar power. This is where solar technology converts sunlight into electrical energy through photovoltaic panels, as you can see there. In less than 40 years, there has been a 97% reduction in the price of these solar panels. So that's all good news. However, the production of these panels is extremely detrimental to the environment. Not only are large amounts of CO2 emitted in the process, but when refining silicone into polysilicone, a harmful compound, silicon tetrachloride, is released into the environment. This is usually just dumped on to neighboring fields, acidifying soils, and contaminating local water sources. On top of that, to power a city the size of London, you need 4.6 million solar panels. This would take up 3,000 acres of land, so not really that efficient. Anyways, most energy harness is done around midday, which is when we receive most sunlight. But then energy demands peak at 7.30 a.m. and again at 6.30 p.m. So what happens? We go back to resorting to fossil fuels. It's not really that good. On top of that, PV panels need changing every 25 to 30 years. After that, then what? They end up in special landfills where they release toxic lead into the environment. So just again, more nasties. So for some people, solar panels glimmering in the sun is an icon of green energy. But I ask you, is it really? I'd argue no, and I hope now you would too. So what about wind power? This is where wind turbines convert kinetic energy, the energy in moving things, into electrical energy. As of 2021, the average wind turbine had, wind farm had around 150 turbines. Each turbine needs 80 gallons of oil as lubricant. Now, I'm not talking about synth vegetable oil. I mean synthetic oil based on crude. Now, to power a city the size of, let's say, New York, you'd need 3,800 wind turbines. That would need 304,000 gallons of oil each year. Now, that's just for one city. So imagine the oil consumption for a whole nation for clean energy. On top of that, each turbine requires a 1.5 acre footprint. So for the average wind farm, we're talking about 225 acres of land. This all has to be clear cut, so I mean no trees, no plants, no animals, nothing. What about the disposal? After that, just like PV panels, these have a 25 to 30 year lifespan and then they end up in special landfills, most of which are running out of space. On top of that, each these wind farms kill 1.17 million birds in the US alone. Most are endangered species. And I know cats kill more than that, but they kill small birds. These kill large birds, such as eagles. So really, how green is wind energy? So from this, it is clear renewable resources just are not the way to power our future. So you might be thinking, well, Mathilde, if it's not solar power, if it's not wind energy, well, what is it? You guessed it. It's nuclear power. Now, this is a non-renewable energy resource, which is, in fact, 100% carbon neutral in the energy production process itself. And it is usually fueled by uranium. Energy is harnessed when uranium atoms undergo a process called fission. They release energy, heat up water, and drive a turbine. Now, scientists have estimated 
that our uranium reserves will lost us maybe for the next 90 years. However, thorium, whose reserves will lost us for the next 100,000 years, is also a viable fuel option for nuclear fission, though this happens in molten salt reactors. In fact, to power a medium-sized city of around 1 million inhabitants, you'd need just one ton of natural thorium. And I know this does require the mining of the thorium. However, a relevant comparison that puts things into perspective is that with coal, which requires 3.3 million tons of coal to power the same size city. I don't know about you guys, but I definitely say that's an improvement. And let's go on to the safety of these reactors. Nuclear accidents, such as those that happened in Fukushima and Chernobyl, have shown that the major risk in these plants lie in the spreading of radioactive iodine, cesium, and strontium. In normal reactors, these appear in a volatile airborne form that can easily spread to contaminating large populations. However, in a molten salt reactor, these are ionically bonded to the salt in the middle, which just means they're found in a very strong bond, so they're no longer found in volatile airborne forms. Now, this is where it gets even better. These, this type of reactor is 100% walk-away safe. What this means is that if we were to, humans were to walk away from the plant, there would be absolutely no possibility of a nuclear meltdown or explosion. This is because of two reasons. One, they are, they, they are not pressurized and contain no water. And two, they contain a safety mechanism called freeze plug. This kicks in when the inside of the reactor starts to overheat. On top of that, you know how getting rid of nuclear waste is such a big challenge? Well, in these reactors, re spent fuel can be reused to provide even more energy on top of that. And then, only 97% of radioactive waste from these molten salt reactors can be used, it needs to be kept for 10 years. And then only 17% needs to be kept f for 300 years. So basically, 99.99% of that fuel is completely stable in just 300 years. So that's definitely great. And then the cherry on the top is the low cost of this fuel. A ball of thorium the size of my fist would be able to power the rest of my life at a cost of 10p per day. It can't get any better than that. Now what I'm trying to say isn't that thorium-based molten salt reactors are the only solution, the best solution. But because it is a brilliant piece of technology, this is non-renewable and it does have its downfalls. In an ideal scenario, we would be able to harness energy just like our sun does through nuclear fusion. Though there has been major advancements in the past few weeks and months, this is still not a place which, where it would be economically viable and, is, and its efficiency is not yet where we want it to be. The climate time bomb is ticking now, and we, the climate time bomb is ticking and we need to act now. As we strive for a sustainable future, we must recognize that molten salt reactors powered by thorium fuel are a stepping stone in the right direction. The urgency of the climate crisis demands action now. Thank you.